Okay, so good evening, everyone, and welcome. We've got a great crowd this evening. Happy March 15th. Um, my name is Jesse Jones, and I am the Coast Watch Volunteer Coordinator. And tonight I am here with Nancy Treneman, and we are um, bringing you a wonderful talk about Nudibranx. I'm very excited. Before Nancy begins, I'm just going to say a few words about Oregon Shores and Coast Watch. So um, Coast Watch is a program of Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. Um, Oregon Shores is a regional group that works to protect the environment of the entire coastal region from the Columbia River to the California border and from the crest of the coastal, coastal mountains to the edge of the continental shelf. In addition to organizing Coast Watch and citizen science, um, Oregon Shores tackles a wide range of conservation concerns um, all up and down the Oregon coast, including land use planning, endangered species, shoreline management, and marine conservation. Through our Coast Watch program, volunteers adopt one mile segments of the Oregon shoreline and keep a watch for a wide range of natural phenomenon and human impacts. Um, we also organize a number of citizen science projects. Um, this year and into 2020, we are really focusing on our rocky habitats and our rocky shores, these very fragile, beautiful, um, places of ecological concern and wonder. And so our programming, um, as well as bringing you information about marine debris and so much else, um, we also will be focusing on our very special rocky shores, which the majority of these habitats are actually on the south coast. And so um, if you have any questions about Coast Watch, you, there will be questions afterwards for Nancy and myself, um, but you can always also email me as well and, um, or call me on the phone to learn about the uh, array of uh, programs and new programs actually this year um, that we are offering that really are kind of focusing on looking for um, marine diseases and rocky habitats and a lot more. So we get started. I'm going to stop okay, sharing and so that you can share now. Right. So if everybody first, I just want to note that in the chat, I've put a link to a really great new break video that was done by a person named Z Frank. And he does a lot of really funny nature videos with people's um, people collect images of, of particular organisms, and then he makes these great videos. And the images on this are one of my great, uh, one of the greatest nudibranchers ever. Jeff Goddard did, contributed a lot to uh, that video, so I just wanted to let you know that. And Nancy, I'm going to um, give you one more pause because through all of that, you know, being on the phone, I forgot to actually officially introduce you. So Nancy Treadman is joining us this evening. Um, Nancy is a marine biologist specializing in shipworms, nudibranch, seaweeds, microgastropods, and marine debris. Nancy is a retired high school science teacher. She taught at Hood River, Newburgh, and 10 years at Gold Beach. She is a faculty member at OIMB. And she also um, studies studying shipworms in Hawaii. Is that correct? And I hope to have Nancy back one day to talk about shipworms, the Coast Watch, because I want to know all about them. So welcome, Nancy. I'm so glad to have you. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate people's patience with me on the phone. Um, nudibranchs are uh, an amazing group of organisms. I've always loved them. I, I, everybody, they, they're so pretty and they're so unusual. I spent a lot of time looking at them in the intertidal zone, but really got involved in uh, them about 2015 when Jeff Goddard asked me to help out with the nudibranch surveys where we were looking at how they responded to climate change and that period of time where we had the El Nino and the hot blob. And after that, I just become completely addicted to them. So um, welcome. So this is one of our uh, nudibranchs that are on our coast. Cryofa Catalina, the clown nudibranch. And you can see it has all the nudibranch parts, very unusual extensions of the mantle, these cute little antenna-like things called rhinophores. We're going to talk a lot about uh, the anatomy of the nudibranchs and their colors tonight. I want to thank uh, all kinds of people who have 
helped me on my journey with nudibranchs and marine invertebrates. Jeff Goddard uh, is uh, the person I met. Uh, I actually took his class in something like 2006, and he inspired me on how to teach in the field and, of course, how to find nudibranchs. Jim Carlton, my mentor of many years and many projects, uh, David Diane Bilderbeck, lots of great fun out there in the tide pools of people. So thank you, everybody. So today we're going to talk about nudibranchs and what they do and why they have such outrageous colors and forms. If you look at this nudibranch here, this is Dirona picta, one that I found um, at Five Mile Point. It's abandoned. It has all the new bank parts, just like the one we just saw, except you'll notice that all of these feathery things are sticking out. These are called serrata. And here's the rhinophores, which I pointed out in the previous new rank. This is the oral um, hood right here and the little foot down below. So notice that this new rank and this new rank have some different parts on the back. We'll talk about that. Nudibranchs are in the group Mollusca. So animals are broken up into large groups with similar traits called phyla. And nudibranchs are in the Mollusca phyla. We're going to talk about the characteristics the mollusks have and how nudibranchs fit into that. First of all, mollusks are bilateral. Here's a classic nudibranch, and you can split it in two only one way. It has two sides. This is bilateral symmetry. You might think, well, what other kind is there? Well, there's a kind of like a pizza. So sea anemones and starfish have radial symmetry. Nudibranchs and mollusks all have a mantle. This is a structure unique to mollusks. If you look at this beautiful nudibranch, which is uh, one from our coast, Doris nobilis, the mantle is this kind of cloak that covers the top. Mollusks have amazing amounts of mantle forms. So here is a giant clam. The mantle is right here. And the mantle makes the shell in mollusks that have shells. The blue is from symbiotic bacteria that live in the mantle of the giant clam. Very cool. This is a squid, and its mantle is a cylinder. And the shell inside the squid is just a little thin plastic-like thing. Cuttlefish, which are relevant, rel relatives of squid, have a calcium carbonate, kind of almost like a little sugar loaf in there. Cowrie, here's the mantle of the cowrie and the shell. This is a limpet from our coast. The shell is very tiny and the mantle is very large. Lots of different mantle forms. If you look at your basic mollusk body plan, and this is primitive. This is the first basic mollusk that, that we, we know of. It has the shell on the top. It has the mouth, and we'll talk about what the radula is. And back here in the back, it has a gill cavity. It's called the mantle cavity and then the foot. So this is your basic mollusk. If you look at chitin, this is the gumboot chitin from our coast. This is the underside. Big foot mantle, and here's the gill in there. This is the gill cavity of the chitin. So mollusks also have a very unusual nervous system. We have a very centralized nervous system. Our brain is the center, and it runs everything. Mollusks have a lot of little brains. They have nerve centers that run their mouth. They have nerve sent three different pairs of nerves that are technically called the brain. And then back here in the back, they have some little pairs of ganglia that control the guts. You'd think, whoa, they're all spread out. You know, how much, how intelligent can a, can a mollusk be? Well, you know what? They can be really smart. Octopus is the smartest invertebrate. And uh, they just, there was a couple articles this week about how they just passed the human child intelligence test. They were able to delay gratification ahead, some things like that. And octopus are very, very smart. If you want to see a really cool movie, watch My Octopus Teacher. It's so good. Mollusks also have a very unusual structure called the radula. 
This is like a long ribbon with little teeth along it, kind of like a chainsaw. It's the tongue of the mollusk. And it can take a lot of different forms. It can be like a stiletto with just one big tooth. In this case, you can see that there's lots and lots of little teeth along the ribbon. This is your basic snail. If you look at the SEM, the scanning electron microscope of the um, radula, they're amazing. This is the radula of our local limpet that I just showed you, the one with the big mantle. This is the radula of this little guy, the sea lemon, a nudibranch. So each species has specific teeth shape and specific numbers of teeth in their radula. It's one way to tell what species they are. And it's defined by what they eat. So the door right here, this little nudibranch is a sponge eater. And other sponge eaters are gonna have radulas which allow them to eat sponges. Radulas can also change with life stage. So a radula can be one shape. When the juvenile's eating one kind of food, it can change as it moves to a different kind of food. Radulas are very cool. Most mollusks have shells, right? We shell collections, beautiful cone shells, conch shells, nautilus shells, and the mantle makes the shell. Queen conch has a shell, the chitons have shells, but not all mollusks have shells. The bivalves, the clams, the scallops have shells, but the octopus does not have a shell. The land slug does not have a shell. The nudibranch does not have a shell. How is nudibranch different from, say, the land slug? Besides the fact, of course, it's losing the ocean. So we're going to now focus right specifically on the nudibranchs. The word nudibranch means naked gill. Naked, nudie, branch, gill. This beautiful nudibranch here, which was photographed in California at Monterey, this is the gill. So no gill cavity, which is kind of interesting because you saw the primitive mollusk body plan has a gill cavity. Naked gill, the gill's outside. This one can pull the gill into a little pouch when it gets scared, but um, it has to, it'll extend it when it's happy as it is. Here. Most nudibranchs are predators. They eat other animals. They even eat other nudibranchs. Some, a few nudibranchs seem to scrape diatom scum off certain on substrates. So there are some nudibranchs that are um, herbivores. A couple of nudibranchs can eat algae and, and accumulate algae in their mantle. And they actually help photosynthesize and the algae feeds the nudibranch. This is true of another group of sea slugs called saccharobosans, but a few nudibranchs also do this too. Nudibranchs are hermaphrodites, which means that they're both male and female at the same time. They have uh, outrageous ways of mating, and they both have penises, and they have various kinds of ducts, and they lay eggs, and we're not going to talk about it. <laughs> it's a whole other topic that we're, that we're covering today, but nudibranch uh, reproduction is amazing. Nudibranchs, weirdly enough, can't see. You can see light and dark. They have little eye spots right behind the rhinophores, right in front. But they can't see color. They can't see shapes, which is very strange because they are so pretty. Hmm. Wonder why. How do they detect their environment then? Well, they have these great rhinophores here. These are chemosensory. They sense their environment through chemicals, and their bodies are also really sensitive to touch and pressure. If you just uh, wave your arm, uh, hand, or finger over a nudibranch, they'll hunch up, they'll crawl away. They're very sensitive to pressure. They also, when they touch each other, you can tell right away they know what they're doing. When they touch the side of a dish, they act very differently than when they touch each other. So they're aware of surfaces, chemical-wise, pressure-wise, et cetera. This is the rhinophore, which is specific to nudibranchs, and it's the chemosensory device. Now, nudibranchs have two basic body plans. The fuzzy, hairy one, like this one, the aeolid body plan, has these feathery serrata on top. The serrata can concentrate toxins, concentrate algae cells, concentrate stinging cells from their prey. They, have, uh, they, they are one way to get oxygen into the body, and the digestive glands often go up into the serrata. Here are the rhinophores, and here are the oral 
uh, tentacles on this. This is called the shag reg nudibranch, at least that's my nickname for it. Nudibranchs live everywhere. They live from the Arctic to the Antarctic. There are thousands and thousands of species. I have to tell you that every time you turn around, someone's describing a new species of nudibranch. I think we just found seven off the deep sea of the Monterey. And there are probably three times this number of nudibranchs in the world, if not more. So hunting for new nudibranch species is everybody's favorite activity. They tend to not live very long. Most nudibranchs live maybe a year. Now, some of the deep sea ones and the ones in the Antarctic live quite a long time, but the ones off our coast, the ones in the tidal zone, are gonna live a short time. All, all nudibranchs are all ocean. Some will live in estuaries where the salinity is low, but they are not gonna live in freshwater. They lay eggs. And so here is can, kind of the range of depth, intertidal zone all the way down to uh, thousands of feet. And I think I even read that there's some that deeper than this. So they are amazing in their ability to, to evolve forms that live at all these different depths. Here's the second body plan. This is called the Dorid body plan. Turns out Doris was a Greek uh, nymph, nymph of the ocean who was bountiful, the responsible for the ocean's bounty. So it's very appropriate that these are Dorids. The Dorid body plan has the gills and a little floret coming out of, a, out of a pouch. And this floret can move, some of it's here, a lot of them have it in the rear end, and some of it have it up here in the middle. Mantle, rhinophores, that's your dorid. So aeolid, dorid. This is an egg case laid by a dorid, a ribbon. And this is the uh, Peltodorus nobilis egg ribbon. In the background, you see a sponge, which is the prey, one of the prey items of that species. Naked gill, that should have gone first, <laughs> okay. This is a video of a deep sea nudibranch. I just had to share this, it's too cool. Daphidorus aoka. Now, 29 centimeters apart. So that dorid is essentially this long. It weighs about a pound. Look at the cute little gills in the back. Neat little rainforest. That is just the craziest creature. Why don't nudibranchs have shells? Why does any mollusk evolve to have no shell? There's got to be a major advantage to that because shells are great protection. This is a red abalone, one of the major heavy-duty shells that we find uh, mollusks with a, mollusk with a heavy-duty shell we find in our intertidal zone. Moon snail, same thing. You can hide underneath. You, your predators have a hard time getting to you. So evolving no shell has to come. There has to be a big advantage to that. How do nudibranchs protect themselves since they don't have a shell? This is a nudibranch on its prey. Can you see the nudibranch? Where is it? The prey is a feathery stuff. That's the hydrozoan. And this is the nudibranch. A little gender notice. Pretty cryptic. So camouflage is one of the major tools nudibranchs have to hide. They also have this really, some of them have really amazing behaviors. This is called a diamatic color display. This particular species of nudibranch has these amazingly spiky serrata. And when it's disturbed, they will bristle and quiver and get very straight and pointy. And this particular nudibranch eats, I think, coral. And it eats some kind of nidarian where, it's, where it takes the stinging cells from the coral and concentrates it in the serrata. And the stinging cells still work. So when the predator brushes the serrata, it gets stung. Cool. Countershading. This is true of a couple nudibranchs because some nudibranchs literally live in the open ocean and do not live on the bottom, but live in the water column in Florida. This species here, which is one of the poster child 
I think this was on the cover of one of the high school textbooks I taught on for 10 years, Glaucus Atlanticus. It, this is even a Portuguese man of war, and it's a pelagic open ocean nude brain. And look at this coloration. This is called countershading. So dark on top, because if you're a predator on the top and you look down into the water, it's dark. So you can't see the nude brain because it's dark. Light on bottom, because when you're a predator and you look up, the water is silver and the nudibranch is silver and highs. And you see this kind of countershading all the time in fish, for instance, whales, and uh, nudibranchs also have evolved this coloration pattern also. However, what we're really interested in is why do so many nudibranchs stand out? Why are they so obvious? This is a great yellow lemon. Uh, this is called Doriopsilla fulva. This, from, this picture is from South Cove, Cape Arago. There's a sponge. I don't know if it eats this particular species of sponge, but and it was sitting there. It's quite bright. It's pretty obvious. Now, it's because nudibranchs eat some very interesting things. Their, their, their stand-up coloration is because of their prey. They eat sponges. They eat hydrozoans, sea anemones, and coral. What are these items have in common? They're poisonous, they're toxic, they're, they're pretty tough to eat. They also eat bryozoans, and I have uh, Dave Bilderbeck, who's a fantastic bryozoan scientist, has informed me that bryozoans are not poisonous, but they do have lots of little spines. Tunicates are very acidic. They have sulfuric acid in them, and, and a lot of nudibranchs eat acidians. Some nudibranchs are, eat everything, worms, other nudibranchs, and lots of other stuff. But in general, these warring color, the ones that have the standout color, eat these toxic prey items. So, and many of these, these uh, ones with the brilliant colors specialize on one prey. They'll eat only one species of sponge or one tiny group of sponges. And that is probably because that sponge, they have to evolve the ability to withstand that toxin. And the ability to withstand many, many toxins, it gets tough to evolve all those immunities. Here is, however, a predatory nudibranch on nudibranchs. You gotta feel really sorry for the little nudibranch in this show. This is the big bomb. Eating little guy. Now you'll notice he's not exactly the most efficient predator. Since he can't see. <laughs> Where is it? Ah. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here. We finally got a hold of it. It reminds me of a boa constrictor. The person who took this video, the, the credit is right here, Money Watchers. I suspect that that's quite a large food item to take in, so it's, it takes a lot to um, get your mouth around it. And off he goes. I think you can see the one that he ate inside there. He 
you have to think about why would something want to eat toxic prey? The sponge evolved these toxins on purpose, right? <laughs> from being eaten. You'll notice that these uh, two uh, nudibranchs don't really, aren't really concerned about the toxicity of their prey. So there's something interesting going on here. And of course, if you eat toxic prey, you don't have a lot of competitors. No one else wants to eat it. If you live in an environment that's food limited and you can stand in, and eat something that's toxic, then you're ahead of the game. Nudibranchs clearly have gone this route, but how, what, do you, what has to happen evolutionarily in order to eat stuff like this? Well, first of all, you have to develop immunity to the toxins. You can't kill you. What do you do with those toxins when you eat them? Well, you can hide them somewhere in your body. You can put them out on the edge of the mantle. You can, um, you can store them in exposed parts. You can change the toxins to a non-toxic substance. That's what we do with ethanol. <laughs> and nudibranchs do all of these kinds of things. And now that some nudibranchs even make their own toxins. So you've developed immunity. You've sequestered the toxins. You either made them uh, non-toxic or you stored them someplace where they're not going to kill you. And so now you're poisonous because you've got these toxins in you. Great, right? What do you do now? Well, you could probably know what this means. Aposomatic coloration. We see a lot of it. Monarch butterflies are poisonous because they eat milkweed. Skunks are warning us right here, no touch. Go away. <laughs> poison dart, poison arrow, no. Poison dart arrow frog, poison arrow dart frog, anyway, no touch. Hill monster, no touch. All of these are animals that have evolved warning coloration. Let's look at nudibranchs for a minute. Here we have one that's pretty colorful, right? Is this warning coloration? Well, here it is on its prey item. What do you think? Is that a is that a camouflage or is that warning? A little tough to tell. Here is another nudibranch with pretty fancy colors. Purple, red, yellow. It's pretty, pretty attractive, pretty obvious. Here it is on a substrate on a rock that I found this one just last week at North at Middle Cove in Ergo. This is the cutest nudibranch ever. Look at how big it is. This is a millimeter, tiny little thing but pretty cryptic on its substrate. In the dish, pretty obvious. How do you find a nudibranch? You generally, you have to look for their prey. They're fairly tiny, and they're hidden. They're under crevices. They're under rocks. They don't want to have heavy surf action because it just blows them off their prey. You find nudibranchs essentially in two reasons. One is that they're on their prey, eating it, or they've been blown off of it, and they're floating around. We love floaters because they're a lot really obvious. They're floating on the water, literally. You, nudibranchs increase during the summertime, so you'll find a lot more of them uh, in the warmer seasons. But there's sponges, there's ascidians, there's hydrozones everywhere, and there's not a lot of nudibranchs. So they're much scarcer than their prey. Here's a rock that I just found last week at Middle Cove, and it's got a nudibranch on it. Let's see if you can see it. We're going to, now, is, is this a nudibranch here? No, that's an Abu chitin, about five years old. That's the nudibranch, Haloxyshani, really cute. Here's Haloxyshani's egg cases, and here's a slime sponge that Haloxyshani eats. And you can see a lot of the sponge has been chewed up. All these holes are from the nudibranch chomping away. On the rock is also a veiled chitin, and there's a sea urchin down below. Epiactis, which is a mother anemone. Over here, more mother anemones. The rock's covered with little tube worms called spirorbids. There's some other sponges on there besides the one Haloxy was eating. Well, it might have been all of them, but it, it specializes on the slime sponge. There's another chitin. There's a polychaete worm. Lots of things on this rock. I can turn over 10, 15 rocks before I find one with a nudibranch on it. I have to find the prey item on the rock, and then there has to be a nudibranch on that rock, on that prey item. 
Should a nudibranch hide? Should it advertise? Or can it do both? Here's Rostanga sitting on its red sponge that it eats. When Rostanga is on a lighter color red sponge, it's a lighter color. Rostanga is red because it eats red stuff and the red pigment gets in the mantle. It's cryptic here, but believe me, when it's a floater, you can see it. It's just it's one little red thing on this gray rock. One thing that we know, because nudibranchs have these colorations, is that their predators are visual. The predators that eat nudibranchs use their eyes to see them. Nudibranchs can't see, but it's really not about what they can see, it's what their predators see. Fish and crustaceans are some of the major predators of nudibranchs, and they are visual predators. If you are going to evolve warning coloration, if you're going to evolve coloration that says, I'm poisonous, well, the predator has to survive the encounter, and so do you. The predator has to survive because it has to learn to not eat your species. It has to learn that that is bad, tastes like bleh, right? You have to survive because your coloration is a genetic trait and it has to be passed on to your offspring. If you die, well, you don't have any offspring and therefore your genes don't get passed on. If the predator dies, it's not gonna learn anything, right? So this warning coloration system only works if all of these things are true. And in the Newbrink's case, they are. This is, I don't, I don't think I'd ever put these colors together in my wardrobe ever. <laughs> it's very, very wild warning coloration of, uh, I love the names of nudibranchs. Nemo Bratha Kubarayana. I probably said that wrong. So here's an experiment. People, people look a lot at whether it's really true that nudibranchs are toxic and how toxic they are and if predators actually do avoid them. And so this is an experiment from... Uh, Rogers and Paul, 1991, and they took these nudibranchs and they looked at their toxins and they, they isolated them and they found out what toxins they had and what their prey items and their prey items were toxic. And then they gave the, um, these fish, they're serious predatory fish, the trigger fish, the spotted wrasse. They gave all these fish species the choice of eating the nudibranch. What they did is they put, they starved these fish until they're really hungry. And then they put them all in the same aquarium and then they drop the nudibranch into the water as it floats down to the bottom. And they observe what the fish do. Now, I was really glad to know that the nudibranch could not see all of these fish going for it because it probably would have a mental breakdown. But what happened in the lab is that all the fish rejected the nudibranch. They got to the bottom of the tank without being eaten. Sometimes it was eaten and spit out three or four times. In this case, one nudibranch was spit out by five fish before it hit the bottom. And they tested to make sure the fish actually wanted to eat by giving the fish regular fish meat, and they ate those just fine. So they were clearly rejecting the nudibranch. Then they went out into the reef. They went out to the field, and they did the same thing. They dropped the nudibranch down. They let go of it as it traveled down the water column, and there were fish around, and they wanted to see what would happen out there in the field. Well, very different story. So... Some fish did reject this nudibranch species, but a lot of them ate it. In fact, nine out of 10 of the nudibranchs did not reach the bottom. And the fish also ate the egg masses of the nudibranch. So in other words, some fish have learned to avoid this poisonous animal. Some fish may have evolved the ability to eat it and of course, resist the toxin themselves. You can tell that the lab versus the field, very different results. Now let's look at another experiment. And to do this, we're going to look at a really, really fantastic group of nudibranchs called the chromodorids. Everybody wants to do research on chromodorids. First of all, they're in the tropics, so you get to scuba dive. Second of all, they are the amazing, amazing colors. Look at this. Is this not an amazing creature? Yeah, this one's name is, I think that that's, uh, oh, Chromodorus magnifica. There's your chromodorus. And there's a whole bunch of little chromodoruses. What do you see that really stands out besides the fact they're outrageously colored? Look at the edges of the mantle. 
they all have these very defined edges. And the edges contain really high toxins. They have a whole bunch of glands where they store the toxins. They can actually e eject it in little sticky uh, strings sometimes. So they concentrate the toxins in different parts of the body that are most easy to access. So when a fish bites a nudibranch, he's going to bite the edge. This one has a cute little cherry on top. You know why? That cherry is really concentrated toxins. So the fish is going to be lured to eat that and reject that. Maybe go away with a really bad taste and smell. Commodores are sponge specialists. Sponges are protected in two ways. They have toxins. And each different sponge group has different kinds of toxins. And they have sharp, pointy little things called spicules. And these are microscopic, but they're thousands and hundreds of thousands of them all stacked up to give the sponge their shape. So if you are going to eat a sponge, you have to find a way to avoid the spicules and evolve an immunity to the toxins. This particular chromodorid, I picked these pictures for a particular reason. This is the same species of chromodorid. On the purple sponge, it's, but if it's eating the purple sponge, it kind of blends, doesn't it? If it's eating an orange yellow sponge, it blends. So the evolution uh, development of these organisms is very interesting. Is this a different genetic variant than this? Or is this because it lived on this sponge and was young and, and developed that color? I don't know the answer. I think someone does. This is a study which was done recently looking at chromodora genetics and, and who's who and toxins, just to show you where they live. This is where all the sampling sites were. You can see the chromodorids tend to concentrate in the tropics. Although here's one over down here in Chile, where it's actually very cold. We have a few on our coast down here um, in California. Where do chromodorids store toxins? In this study here, which was uh, winters 2018, they found that a few of them store them all through the body, like this one here. Gani Branca's ver varia, varia. Most of them concentrate the toxins in their mantle and in around, along the edges of the mantle. One, I think, stored them in its guts, which is kind of counterproductive. But there you have it. We did toxin trials on different various um, species. We're going to look at. Ceratostoma brevicardatum with the cherry. And what they do here with brine shrimp, they do two different things. Once they just put the brine shrimp in water with the toxin and see how many die. And in this case, this is the concentrated of the toxin. And you can see they start to die pretty soon. And at about one milligram per milliliter, 100% of the brine shrimp are dead. And these are, these are concentrations from the nudibranchs. They take the nudibranchs and they extract the toxins. Of course, they have to kill them and grind them up. And they extract the toxin from the nudibranch. So this toxin is from this species. Then they make little, little pellets of food and they, they uh, soak them in the toxin. And they see if the brine shrimp will reject pellets. So you can see that the percent rejected, they'll, they'll eat some when there's just a little bit, but right here, and those is a logarithmic scale, which means this is each one, one is 10 times greater than the other. Uh, they start to reject, and certainly here uh, at 10, rejecting everything. So this is a pretty serious uh, toxin, and the brine shrimp don't like it. Let's look at another species. This is Gl Glossodorus vespa, the one with the really cool yellow frill on the side. Here we have the brine shrimp uh, test. Notice here that this toxin is a lot less uh, lethal. It takes much more to kill a brine shrimp and you never get to 100% death. Notice that the viscera is much less toxic than the mantle. And if you look back to the last slide, the same thing was true here. The viscera is much less toxic than the mantle. Sorry, I didn't do that. And then here, the brine shrimp rejection test well, they didn't really start rejecting it at all until here. So this species is less toxic than the previous one. Those are the kinds of things you can look at to see how these organisms are evolving these toxicities 
and possibly what their real predators out in the field would experience. Now, if you look at their color patterns, you can ask the question, and this is the question all new to rank people ask, is are these color variations of the same species or are these different species? We're finding out on our coast at least that color variations generally mean that they're different species. You have something that looks very much the same but the rhinophores are orange instead of white and it turns out that they're different species. You have something that has small spots and big spots and it turns out that they're different species. Now these are all from Australia and they have red spots. Do you think, for instance, that these two might be the same species? Well, of course, the answer is that these guys are mimicking, mimicking each other. They are all different species. There's their species names, so Chromodoruses, but they have Splenda, Tasmaniensis, I guess you know where that one lives. So mimicry is when you copy your neighbor. And this is because, of course, the predators are learning. The predator learns to spit this one out, and it sees this one, which is so similar, and I think, hmm, maybe not. And this evolves, especially if you're living around each other. If these two species live in the same area, and they may start off thousands of years ago looking fairly different, but if they have some traits in common, say spots, and the predators learn to reject this kind of spot, and you just happen to have a similar spot, then you're going to survive. And so what's interesting is that these species that evolve mimics, they don't have to be closely related at all. You have very different, genetically different species that become much more similar because they're living with the same suite of predators. You can see this in this map here done by wonderful, wonderful nudibranch scientist, Bridman. This is Australia. And he has broken it up into zones. So the nudibranchs in this area here all have similar color patterns. There can be very different species. Each number is a different species. And yet they have evolved this similar color pattern because they're mimicking each other. This group here, similar color patterns, this group here. This mimicry is another part of what you see in uh, nudibranch coloration. Well, I actually don't know how long I've talked because I did not put on my timer. So I hope that I'm about done. Jesse, how am I doing time-wise? You are, we're at 645. So it's it's great. Good to see you. I did, I, did, did I, I don't think I went too fast. So yes. <laughs> so we have time for questions. Yeah. So um, for instance, we talked about mollusks. And while you're in your there at your computer, you can type in a question if you want to in the chat and Jesse will. Um... Yes, please do. Uh, and we have, we've already had a couple of questions. So I'm gonna great. pull those up. Um, okay, let me put the list up here so people can remind, be reminded. The very first one was, um, let's see. Well, let's see, I gotta go back. Oh, what role does the Ragula, or is it Radula? Sorry. Radula. Apart, apologies for not being a scientist. No, what, no. what role does the Radula play in the predatory Gymnodorus? And that is from. Sorry. Oh, you mean the one that was sucking in the prey? The one that was the. Oh, this predatory Gymnodorus was. Oh, I know what you're. Is that the one that was eating the other one? Probably. I don't know specifically what that one's Radula looks like. Sometimes these radulas can be very minimal, have just literally a stylet with, that is like a, uh, and injects poison into the prey. So cone shells, for instance, their radula has a big, one big tooth and it acts like a uh, needle. The radula of, um, some, some radulas are pretty remedial, like there's a group of midbrains I call the spitters. And the spitters spit on their prey, uh, a bunch of chemicals, and it just digests it and they suck it up. So the one that you saw sucking in the other one may not use its radula. It may literally just suck in its prey and digest it inside. I'd have to look that up. But radulas are really, like the octopus's radula is inside. It's little, it has that beak, right? And there's a little radula in there. And if you've ever 
been told there are really poisonous octopus, they will bite you. And uh, some of them can inject a poison into your arm or wherever it bites you and if you even have it. So I don't know about that specific species, but I hope I gave you kind of a, an overview. Great, thank you. Okay, so we've got questions in the chat and um, in the Q&A. So I'm gonna go back and forth here a little bit. Um, Nancy, how often have you seen automatized or regenerated serrata? Quite often. They, they, do you see this beautiful one right here, the Antiopella? When you pick it up, a few serrata will fall off. And if you're and it, as it gets if it if it gets too hot, more will fall off. It turns out that nudibranchs can be heated up and cooled down uh, to a certain extent and survive. But their serrata will come off and they will grow new ones. Uh, it turns out that nudibranchs do survive uh, being wounded, which of course is very important if you're going to develop warning coloration. I find nudibranchs all the time with little pieces and chunks missing that are healing up. I, uh, I often find one with one missing rhinophore. Uh, so the serrata can regenerate. I don't know if the rhinophores can regenerate, but I think they do. I think I saw one regenerating its rhinophore. But I do <laughs> big bites taken out of the mantle. And they do pretty good. Okay, um, here's a good one. What is your favorite nudibranch and why? Ooh, ooh, that's just, that's just evil. That's an evil question. <laughs> um, all right, you see this one hanging here, Antiopella. Um, I'm going to show you the next slide here. This is uh, Dirona albaliniata. I have to say that she's one of my most favorite, just gorgeous. And uh, she often does the same thing that this one does, which was, uh, you'll see this one's essentially walking on water. It'll go upside down and they will crawl along the surface of the water using water tension. And I love, I love these guys. So I would say that these are, this one here is one of my favorites. And the first one, uh, Dirona picta, the one uh, the, the very, in the second slide, really fun. But the dorids are so cute. I love all the dorids, the little, with their little mantles and their little fluffy butts, you know. I mean, <laughs> I love them all. <laughs> uh, here's another great question. Is there a good technique? I love this question. Thank you, Nancy Thomas. This is a very good question because it's kind of talking about tide pooling and which we can do responsibly. And Nancy awesome. Thomas asks, um, is there a good technique in turning over rocks that will result in the least disturbance to the animals living under the rocks? Oh, very good question. Um, first of all, you have to pick a rock that you're physically able to turn over. <laughs> Jeff can turn over bigger rocks than me, and I'm always very jealous because the bigger the rock, the more likely there's a nudibranch under it because if the rock gets rolled around in the surf, the nudibranch will not live on that. It'll get swept off and there won't be any prey on it. It'll all get or, or scoured off. So you want to get a rock and they they like, and, and if you have a rock that has water that can go under it, you're much more likely to have the prey under there and the nudibranch under there. You want to turn the rock over, and if there's stuff on top like sea urchin stuff, you want to take them off so that it get crushed. You turn it over, you bring, and then you want to put it back in exactly the same position. But when you turn it over, often these red rock crabs and porcelain crabs, they scramble to get away. And sometimes they'll hide underneath your foot or right where you're going to put the rock back over. And sometimes there's a chitin just in the way. So you have to yeah, wiggle it back down and get all the crabs out from under it. So it, it, it it, but you can do it. And it's very important to turn the rock back over because the organisms that live on the top of the rock will die and the organisms on the bottom rock will die if you turn it over. It has to be put back in position. Thank you. Awesome. And you know, I just want to say to everyone out there, whether you're a Coast Watch volunteer or not, when you learn these wonderful things, like what Nancy was saying, it's always great if you're not a shy person and someone sees you doing that, you can speak to the person next to you in the tide pool and share your knowledge and then they will know how to also be a responsible tide pooler. Um, next question, can you give a little information about how they breed? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have, it's on their right, on the right side, they have pores and some of them have two, some of them have three pores. And they have a penis that comes out, and they have uh, gonoducts. They don't really call them vaginas because they have different functions. They, some of them have a duct that the sperm goes in and a second duct that the eggs come out. So what will happen is the nudibranchs will position themselves. It's hard for me to do this, kind of like with my hand. Oh, 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I do have pictures, but I can't find, I'm sure that I won't be able to find them. But think about, here's my mouse, near bank. Here's a fossil. Okay, sorry, but um, they'll go together like this. <laughs> this is the face, so this, this is the face. And they'll uh, put their penises into each other and they will hang out. And they'll, they'll, you find them in this position often. And uh, I think what happens is when the tide goes out, they're, they're caught, like, oh my God, we're stuck together and the tide, so we're just there for until the tide comes back in. And um, then they will leave, crawl off, and then they'll excuse these egg ribbons and lay their egg ribbons on the rocks. Some nudibranchs, um, some sea slugs have different kinds of things. So some of them, uh, I don't I don't think it's nudibranchs, but sacoglossins can either be a boy or a girl. So they're half hermit, they're hermaphroditic, but they either take the male position or they take the female position. Um, some of them, the sacoglossins can form mating rings where they're mating <laughs> all around the ring. But the nudibranchs do this. Um, uh, one of them, Triophil Catalina, actually ex, ex, uh, mm. have a mating tube where they where it exudes it from the right side and the penis goes out the mating tube. So pretty pretty fun. And everybody is your partner. It's so great. <laughs> and it's hard to find mates. Guess what? Whoever you find, yeah, uh, I think it really uh, increases the reproductive rate because they are scarce. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, let's see, uh, Victoria asks, are they toxic for humans to touch? No, um, I've touched a lot of them, but they're very delicate. I try really hard to um, actually not touch them. I, I have a little dish that I often pick them up in and then put them back down in. Um, if you find them, the best thing to do is to look at them and not take them off their substrate because it's very hard for them to stick back on and then they get blown out by the surf. So the best thing to do is to enjoy them and get a waterproof camera, like I have, a Nikon W400, and you can put it in the water and take great pictures without even touching them. Awesome, thank you. Um, this is a good question. Are the terms sea slug and nudibranch interchangeable? No, very good question. Sea slugs are a group that nudibranchs belong to. There are sea slugs called sacroglossins that are herbivorous and eat algae. And they don't have rhinophores, they have little rolled parts of their mantle, and they have uh, a different reproductive system a little bit. Uh, there are also cephalospinids that have a little bubble shell inside. So there's a bunch of things we call sea slugs that are not nudibranchs. But what makes nudibranchs special is the lack of shell and the rhinophores. And the two body plans, the, the aeolid feathery one and the dorid. Okay. And they're also pred predators. Thank you. Um, okay, Anne Velisis asks, how many different types of nudibranchs do you typically see on the South Coast? Thank you, Anne. Ooh, well, if you're Jeff Goddard, and especially if you're Jeff Goddard's children, who are the most amazing brankers ever, they go out and I'll find like, I'm really proud of myself when I find, if I find 19 species of nudibranchs, which I did one, I've done a couple times, uh, I just like, you know, it's party time. Usually I'll find 10 to 15, 10 to 12 um, after a couple of hours of work, a uh, species that is. Um, it depends on where you are. North Cove in the summertime, there's this bloom of these, this species here that you're looking at. I'll find hundreds of them, uh, but most of the time not. Uh, but if you're Jeff, you should find something like 32 species or I'll find 19 uh, because he's just got the eyes to really, can see them. Some of them are really tiny. So uh, you get, I get, I'm much better than I used to be. Jeff, Jeff can, Jeff has told me that I've improved. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks, Anne. Uh, great question. Um, let's see. Oh, by the way, though, I, in my lifetime here, I have seen 62 species. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's incredible. And then yeah. we have another question too. It says approximately from Kristen, approximately how many different species are found in our area at Cape Arago, for example, so. Oh, well, I would say close to 30 for me personally. Um, I would say that it's, Jeff has probably found at least 60. Um, yeah, uh, first of all, he spent his graduate school years up there collecting nudibranchs. 
So if you have nothing else to do <laughs> and you get really good at it, he's a master. Um, but for instance, at Crook Point this year, I found more species than I did any other year, year because of course it was COVID time and I had plenty of time to go out there. I think I found 36 species there. Um, but overall, like I said, I've seen 60 and I think Jeff has seen over that for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a little book, but. Yeah. Okay, let's see a few more. Uh, yeah. Steve Garrett asks, hello, Steve. <laughs> How large do nudibranx get? And we know here on the on the south coast that would be well. It's a different answer depending on whether they're sort of in the tide pools or if they're in the deep deep ocean. Which right, right. So you saw the deep sea one. Mm -hmm. The deep sea one is not unusual. There's one in Antarctica that is bigger than that and uh, weighs like 500 grams, which is about a pound and a half. Um, the ones here, you saw how tiny that one was that I showed you the the abronica abronia. It's just two millimeters. Size range is huge. Here on our coast, uh, Peltodorus nobilis, the big yellow one with the white fluffy butt, it can get to be about this big. Wow. That's big. And there's another one, Odinary, who is one of my favorites. It's pure white. It's It can be as big as the mouse. And are, is that subtitled, Nancy, or would that be intertitled? Um, the ordinary is is going to be found at the low low tides, like minus twos. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I found some at Squaw Island. I found uh, Middle Cove. There's a couple, and I found. I think, oh, I found one at um, down there at Checo Point in Brookings. Um, but uh, the other one, Peltodorus, the yellow one with the fluffy white, but it's uh, in in the higher intertidal zone. For instance, it was a minus 0.4, and I found them at Middle Cove this last week. Okay, um, and so we have a we have a question from Bill Stenberg from C. Hello, Bill, um, and he is wondering what the likelihood is of finding one at Kakil Point tide pools in Bandon. I have been there. We're talking about Elephant Rock, right? Yeah. Um, the, if you look at that, I have not actually been there at a low low tide. So Dave and Diane Bilderback would be, be able to answer that question more than me. Um, it depends on, I've been there on a minor low tide and it looks pretty exposed. They're going to be, they, lo they, they love, they have to have nice clean water with good water circulation, but they can't be in heavy surf and they can't be in areas. Um, if there's, there, there's certain species that don't do too badly in, in boulders on sand. Um, but most of them, the, will look, you'll find many more in rockier tidal that is on gravel and without sand. So I would guess there that the nudibranch diversity is pretty low, probably not zero. And then, uh, there's a few that I find in those kinds of environments like um, Nanemoensis, which is really cute, and uh, Hermacenda. So there's a few that, that are gonna be found in those, those tougher areas. I wonder if there's been a bio blitz done um, at Kakil Point and Face Rock in that area. It'd be great to uh, do a special bio blitz day on a super low tide, big negative tide, and see if we can find any any new Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the question, Bill. I'm glad that you're here. Okay, let's see. Who is We've got a lot of questions here? You mentioned some nudibranchs specialize on one species of prey. How has the depletion of coral and sponge habitats in reefs affected nudibranchs? Great question. Oh, this is this is interesting because I just read this interesting um, paper about a nudibranch that lives on parietes, which is a very common coral in Hawaii. And amazingly enough, this is in the same place where I do my strip room research. So I've actually been to this study site, which is cool. And this uh, nudibranch is cryptic. It looks pretty much just like a coral polyp and it eats the coral. And when you put the nudibranch in a tank with the coral, it eats it all. It's just ferocious. It's, it just chews it up and it's gone. But they don't ever find this nudibranch on coral anywhere around the island. It, it isn't there. There isn't any nudibranchs, even though they have it in their tanks and it, they feed it coral, they can't find it out in the field. It turns out that it has serious fish predators. And the fish predators just keep its population pretty much <laughs> close to zero out there in the world. So what's interesting is even though you evolved crypsis, even though you evolved toxins, your predators evolve the ability to deal with that. 
And so nudibranchs, although they might eat coral and they might eat sea anemones and they might eat sponges, they are, are scarce in the environment compared to their prey. And as far as I know, um, the only one thing I did read is that there's an invasive species, I think it's of hydrozoan in Portugal, and a nudibranch has shown up that eats it. Everybody's thrilled <laughs> because it's eating the, the invasive biofouling species. So there you go. Um, Marty, hi, Marty. Marty asked if you can recommend a good reference for Oregon nudibranchs. Yeah, hang on. I have my book. And also, um, while you're looking for that, I can answer Ali's question. Um, what are good spots to find them on the north and central coast? I've had the, a few of these questions tonight. Um, you know, otter rock, seal rock, really some good uh, rocky habitats where you can get out there and low tides. Um, Haystack Rock, of course, Chapman Point. Um, I've seen them at Hug Point. Um, a lot of those, any rocky habitats where you can get out there in some of our um, marine reserve areas as well. Okay, you have that book? Yes, okay, this is Eastern Pacific Nudibranchs. Of course, I think you see it backwards. Too bad, sorry. Um, a guide to the opistobranchs from Alaska to Central America. And the author is David Behrens. B uh, you know what, I can type this into the- Into the chat. Okay. Can I type this into chat? Where is yep, chat? I have to open it up. New share. Q&A? No, it would be the chat. You oh, go okay. down to the bottom of your screen and you'll see like the little right. chat blob there. And um, I can't, oh. anyway, I can't seem to type it in, but it's by David Behrens, B-E-H-R-E-N, B-E-H-R-E-N-S, Eastern Pacific New to Branks, Amazon. Try to buy it from pals though. It's my little plug for you know diversifying our book buying. Um, and it is dated in the sense that uh, it was written in 2005. And so I have a whole lot of annotations in here because the species names have changed or they've split the species into two, but it's still a really good reference. And um, I think it's still the best one. And Marty says, um, your image isn't mirrored for the viewers, just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Marty. And she's right. Um, great. Um, let's see. So we have, I think we're good for, we're just at 7.05. So those of you who want to stick around for a few more questions and answers, that's great. We still have quite a big crowd here. It's wonderful. Um, yeah. Robert Ivy, Bob Ivy. Hi, Bob. Ask if you can recommend a good field guide for our coast. Um, the best field guide is probably something called Kozlov. I have it. Hang on. Wonderful. And let's see, what other questions do we have here? Did I just miss some of these? All right, so this, this depends on how committed you are, okay? This is Kozlov. And Mr. Kozlov is one of the ultimator marine invertebrate scientists of the Pacific Northwest. He's passed away, but he was up at Friday Harbor Labs and many, many, many marine biologists worked with him and were his students. He knew amazing amounts of stuff. And if, this is a guide that goes by habitat. So it's rocky in your title, it has great names. And it's a bit dated on to the names, but basically if you go out in the tide pools, and you see this, these things, uh, you'll be able to find it here and you can look it on the net to find out more about it. Then if you're, if you're even more interested, this is a great picture book. It's called Marine Life of the Pacific Northwest by Lamb and Andy. It is simply a photographic guide, what you find, okay? And um, these are people that got photographed from all over uh, different specialists and they they have a little blurb about each species, but if you 
want to go to school and be a marine biologist, then this. This is Light's Manual by Jim Carlton, well, edited by Jim Carlton, and um, it is a dichotomous key to most of the marine invertebrates on our coast. It has descriptions of the families. It has uh, um, beautiful drawings. It has uh, dichotomy, like here's all the different chitin. Uh, so this is what you would use if you were in invertebrate zoology. But if you are have already done that and you want to pick it back up again, this is great. Lamb is great. Osloff is great. Thank you so much. Okay, a few more questions here. Um, and yes, Linda, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll put that list together and I can um, send it out. If you send me an email, jesse at oregonshores.org. Um, she would like a list of the recommended books. If any of you want the list of recommended books, just email me and I will get those um, yep. to you. Um, J-E-S-S-E -S -S -E at oregonshores.org. So a couple more questions. Bill asks, what is the average number of babies they have per season? Oh my God. Um, nudibranchs, I will find nudibranchs laying eggs in freezing nine degrees centigrade water in January. And I'll find them laying eggs in 12 degree, 13, 14 degree water, even 15 degree water in August. They reproduce whenever they can. And they lay these big long egg, egg ribbons like I showed you one of them. And different species have different numbers of babies in those egg ribbons. So some will have two to three eggs per capsule, one or two eggs per capsule. There's probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of little larvae inside the, one of those big egg ribbons. And I have found a nudibranch next to three or four of those egg ribbons. So lays an egg ribbon, lays an egg ribbon, lays another egg ribbon. Um, that's what they do. <laughs> if you don't lay a lot of eggs, then you're not going to make it. Uh, so that's the main job of a nudibranch. And I would say that a nudibranch in its lifetime will lay millions and millions of eggs, uh, even if it's only going to live a year. But out of those millions and millions of eggs, all those larvae, most of them get eaten because they're in the water column and there's 200,000 filter feeders right next door if you're a mussel or a barnacle and they eat them. So organisms in any environment have to way overproduce because natural selection will pretty much uh, take care of 99% of the offspring and a few of them will make it. Okay, wonderful. Um, Neil asks, do any of the Radula contain metallic elements. Yes, this is cool. Uh, not not nudibranchs that I know of, but for instance, chitons, uh, which often scrape uh, diatoms off of rocks. Their their um, radulas are tipped with iron. Um, I think that there's uh, there's a couple limpet and some limpets have the same thing. They have this. Uh, it's, it's got a special name of the mineral, but it's iron. And so their, their teeth have little black caps on them. Really cute. Right. The magnetic teeth. I've read about that before with the chitons. Um, yeah. An anonymous attendee asks, this is a great question. Where did you get, wondering where you got, first got super interested in nudibranchs and how did you discover them? Well, I always loved them and I always would record when I saw them. But one of, what was interesting is that I said to myself, everybody studies nudibranchs. I'm not going to. I'm going to study something else. So I studied um, limpets. What I, limpets are cool. And I got really turned on to limpets by Jim Carlton. And I always loved nudibranchs, but I thought, oh, you know, it's kind of a field that's taken up. And then when Jeff and I were, uh, I took his class and he said, you know, I'm going to come up and we're going to start surveying for these nudibranchs that are moving, um, the, the, the range is moving north because of the warming. Uh, will you come out with me? And I just realized how much fun it is to find nudibranchs and how wild they are. And then I just gave up and I said, fine, I don't care if everybody on the planet studies nudibranchs, I am going to, I'm going to study them too. So um, I think that you can fall in love with them every time you see one. Every time I see one, it's like, oh, cool, you know? And I, I'm, I'm that way about a lot of stuff though. I have to say, I love hermit crabs, love shipworms. Uh, which is a whole other story. Algae and seaweed. I mean, the ocean's so full of such beautiful things. I just love them all. Uh, 
mix being one of the most obviously beautiful mix them and they're also pretty exciting in a dish they yes um all right so two more questions and then we will close for the evening okay. the first one i'm going to um share is from linda this is a really good question um are you finding plastic bits in these animals oh you know i have not looked and i have not read anything um because they're so specific with their prey and they they eat in general fairly small things such as sponges and hydrosomes. The only ones I think might do the plastic thing would be the ones that live on the plastic. There are nudibranchs that specialize in living on marine debris. Now they used to live on things like pumice and wood, which they still do, but now they have huge amounts of plastic to choose from as well. And you'll find these nudibranchs that are out on marine debris. Uh, they kill. They eat. The, they eat the other organisms that stick to the debris. But I. I don't think that anybody's looked at the microplastic thing. I would assume that there's microplastics in them because it's everywhere. But I have not read up on that. Okay. Yeah. I, I would be curious about that as well. I would assume they are in there because some of they're, their, in, they're in us because they're everywhere because they're in the air. And we don't. Um, we don't even eat. You know, we eat fish. So I guess we do eat marine organisms. Yeah. All right, Marty asks, how are eaten stinging cells moved from the gut to the serrata without being this, triggered at that? <laughs> okay, this I do not know, but somebody does. In other words, I haven't read up on that. But when they eat coral or sea anemones or hydrozoans, the stinging cells are taken by the digestive system from the prey and are translated up into the serrata. Mm. Someone, I have no doubt, knows how that happens. I do not. Okay. We'll find out, Marty. We'll find out. <laughs> you can look it up on Google. Go to Google Scholar and type in nudibranchs, you know, serrata nidoblasts, and you'll probably get a hit, or stinging cells. Okay. And one last question. Um, Corey asked, this is a little bit earlier. Sorry, Corey, I overlooked this, but she was Corey! asking... If the nudibranch in the video was eaten alive, I, I think it was alive when it was yeah, eaten. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. I, I don't think that we have a kindness situation here where they're kind to their prey. And just like the fish who just chew you up and spit you out. So right. you know, nature's tough. Yeah. It if you're a nudibranch. <laughs> Well, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. This was wonderful. Um, we, we had a couple of people ask how many people were here tonight. We actually had 114 people register and more than 80 showed up for this evening. So thank you everyone for coming. Um, yes, if you do want that list of books, you can email um, myself or, or Nancy and um, my, my email is jesse at oregonshores.org. Nancy, what is your email? Um, it's, hang on here, I'll, it's right there. There, ntreneman at gmail.com. I also um, wanted folks to know we are starting some in-person, um, very small gatherings on the South Coast. If you have any interest in joining, we will be doing a sea star observation um, training um, just uh, on Wednesday. Well, wait, yes, on Wednesday, the 17th um, at nine o'clock in the morning um, uh, at somewhere in Cape Arago. I can't remember. I think South Cove. Um, but please contact me if you would like to be a part of that very small group. Um, and there's a lot more happening as well. I can't even remember at this point um, what our next webinar is, but if you would like more information, you can go to oregonshores.org. And if you would like to adopt a mile, please contact me and I will let you know how to do that. And Nancy, it was just super to see you. Yeah, it was great. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be here. And, and I didn't get to see any of you, but I thank you for all your questions and your interest and your attention. Yes, and thank you for being here with us, Nancy. And I hope I see you again soon. Yes, yes. Tide pools, and hopefully you'll come back to us um, and talk about shipworms. Yes, well, and <laughs> do that. Yes, do. Okay, thanks everybody. Good night. Right. Bye. Night, night. Bye, guys. Bye.